Some will say to you, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. James chapter 2 verse 18. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect? James chapter 2 verse 22. And verse 24 says, You see then that a man is justified by works, and not by faith only. James 2 verse 24. Are there limitations to our faith? You know, there are those who preach that all you need for salvation is faith. Faith that Jesus lived and existed and he will save your soul. What is faith? You know, we say we believe. The denominations also say they believe. But what is faith? What do you mean by faith? Well, faith is anything having to do with the acknowledgement of God in our spiritual lives and in our physical lives here on this earth. An acknowledgement that there is a God. Faith consists of beliefs which can guide men's hearts and their lives especially those of Christian saints. Those who believe in God will allow God to drive their life in the proper direction. But faith can be misunderstood. Many of the world's men today misunderstand the purpose of faith and what faith actually is. Many say they have faith, yet they demonstrate that they know nothing at all about God and God's Word. Nor does this man devote any of his life to the Lord and the work of the Lord. Many have said they believe, but they don't do the things that faith allows them to do. They do things that the faith does not allow them to do. Apparently they do not know. God or the Word of God. Faith has some limitations that they have never even considered to begin with. Faith only will not save you. The limitations of faith are something, some of the things we're going to talk about this evening. What do you mean limitations of faith? What kind of limits could faith have? Can faith be obtained in any manner as long as you have it? What do I mean by faith may be acquired? What do you mean by faith is acquired? Well, many out there claim that faith has been received by different methods within their own minds. Some say that there was that sensation of a warm glow when they felt some heartfelt moving experience that occurred to them. That's what developed their faith. Some type of sensation. There are others who say, well, I was praying to God in the middle of the night and I suddenly realized that I believed who God is. Therefore, I have faith in Him. So my faith came by prayer, not by sensation. And there are others who say, well, I had a vision. And in this vision, while I was dreaming of being rescued from some of my life problems, it occurred. And therefore, I have faith in God because He acted in my life providentially. Hmm. Almost any experience can be used to say that you developed faith. For those looking for an unexplained reason a non-biblical reason to believe in God. 
Then, of course, we know there are those whose faith is that there is no God. They truly believe that in their heart. That is their religion. According to the scripture, faith comes from the knowledge of the scripture. So if you don't know the scripture, then you don't have any knowledge or faith of who God is and who his son is. Romans 10, 17, so faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You hear that almost every week, don't you? But people in the world don't know that. They don't know that faith comes by studying the Word of God, hearing it preached. You know, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing it you may have life in His name. John 20, verse 31. So we know for a fact that you must know what the Scriptures are in order to have faith in God. Let's look at a few examples from Acts. If you look at Acts chapter 2, verses 36 and 37, you'll see that P Peter is preaching the first gospel sermon there in Pentecost. How are they learning and developing faith? By hearing the Word of God. Just like it tells you you have to do in Romans 10, verse 17. In Acts um, 8, chapter 8, verse 12, Simon the sorcerer, is listening to Philip teach and he uh, believes what Philip tells him. Philip is preaching to him. He's receiving the scripture. He's learning. Philip also tells a man from Ethiopia in Acts chapter 8 verse 35 and 38. He teaches the Ethiopian and the Ethiopian believes. Of course the Ethiopian was already studying the scripture but he didn't fully understand it. But he did eventually understand the word of God. Looking in Acts 15, verse 9, the Gentiles of Antioch of Syria were being taught by Saul and Bar or Paul and Barnabas the scriptures. And they believed. And they repented and they were baptized. These were some of the first Gentiles to receive the word of God. But it was not without scriptures that they didn't... Uh, except God. They had the scriptures and so they knew. In Acts 11 verse 14, Cornelius sent to Peter for what? For the words that might be taught him by which he might be saved. In other words, he wanted to know the scriptures. He wanted to know what the word of God was. And the Philippian jailer heard the word from Paul, didn't he? He preached to him that night and he was baptized that night. In Acts chapter 16, verses 31 and 32, Paul also taught Crispus and all who were in the synagogue in Acts 18, verse 8, the word of God. So faith comes from knowledge. It's not a mysterious thing. It's all converted people must hear the word of God in order to develop faith in God and in his son, Jesus. If you don't know the word, how can you believe in what you haven't heard? You cannot believe in what you have not heard. Your faith will not enable you to work miracles. Faith was not enabling the working of miracles today as it did back in the days when the church was first started. Faith does not come from miracles in these latter days. Nobody performs these miracles. Miracles do not exist. The age of miracles in the church is gone. Those who worked miracles worked miracles for a definite reason and purpose. Uh, the apostles worked miracles by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Nobody receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit today in the measure in which they received it. Acts chapter 2. You know, many Christians worked miracles by the apostles' hands, as we see in Samaria with Peter and his practice of laying on the hands in Acts uh, chapter 8, verses 16 through 19, which we mentioned just a minute ago. For as yet he has fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
And they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw and thought, saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered money to them, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Simon thought he could buy this. But he could not. It was not available. It's not available to us today. We don't have these miracles. There was a purpose. It was completed. And that was the revealing and the confirmation of the word of God. Looking at Hebrews chapter 2 verses 2 through 4. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast. And every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which first began being spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. This was a gift from God to the apostles to let people know that what they were speaking was the truth, that it was the word of God that they were preaching. In 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 through 12, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. These were some of the gifts that were given by the Holy Spirit to the apostles and to the other people by the laying on of the apostles' hands. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is done away with in, in part will be done away with. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 through 10. What does it say in James 1 verse 25? He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. The perfect law of liberty replaced the miracles. This is the word of God given to us by God himself through the Holy Spirit. What path does it follow? What path does it follow? Well we know that we walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. The path that it follows is the word of God and that's what we must do. Our faith must follow the word of God. It is developed by studying the word of God. It tells us in 1 John 4 verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. And you can tell that by the number of congregations that there are in the world. The differences that they preach. There's false prophets available running rampant in this country. It tells us in Matthew 15, verse 9, And in vain they worship me, teaching the doctrines and commandments of men. Matthew 15, verse 9, We know that men will teach you anything that will get them the power that they want over you. Galatians 1, verses 6 through 8 tells us, If we or even an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. We learned this morning in Bible class, Revelation chapter 14, verse 2, that there was an angel in heaven flying with the eternal gospel, the everlasting gospel. That's what Paul is referring to here. There is only one gospel. 1 Peter 4, verse 11, If anyone speaks... Let him speak as the oracles of God. Let him speak the word of God, the scriptures. That's what he wants us to do. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies. 
that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. 1 Peter 4, verse 11. Faith will never lead you astray. If your faith is developed on the Word of God and not on whatever some man tells you, each and every one of us knows that we must walk the way that the Lord would have us walk. Dead faith cannot save you. Dead faith. Well, what is dead faith? Faith without works is dead. People say you can't be saved by works. No, you can't be saved by works alone. But faith without works is a dead faith. For as the body without a spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. James chapter 2 verse 26. What about John 3:16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't say will not perish. Faith only would make it will not perish, wouldn't it? But you have a right to withdraw yourself from the teachings of God. But you should not perish if you have the faith and you believe the Word of God. If you continue in that faith, you will not perish. If your faith in God is dead, so are you in your eternal soul. You need to keep your faith in God alive. Believe plus trust and obedience is the key to eternal life. Belief in the Word of God. Faith is absolutely necessary. That's James 2.24, 24 through 26, John 3.16. Believe equals trust plus obedience. It's not hard to understand. Obedience is a requirement according to the book of Romans. And you cannot be saved outside of Christ. There is salvation in no other name. That's not what Muhammad teaches, is it? Or Buddha or any of those other ones. Only Christ. Many claim that they've been saved by, first, by faith. I know you've heard them. They will tell you that faith has saved them and that's all they need to do. Yet they are still outside of Christ. They remain outside of Christ. Salvation is only in Christ and it can be in no other. It tells us in Ephesians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Those last two words are extremely important. In Christ is the only place you're going to find Every spiritual blessing from heaven in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Where is that forgiveness? In Him we have redemption. Only in Christ will you have that redemption. There's only one entrance into Christ, and we must enter Christ through baptism. Looking at uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. When you are baptized, your sins are washed away, and you are a new creature in Christ. It's all passed away. You have become new. That's called being justified. You are justified in the waters of baptism just as if I had never sinned. Justified. 
The next step is glorification. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 tells us that for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, we have all been made to drink of one spirit. It is that one body, the body of Christ, in which we have all these blessings. And if you are not in that body, then you are a lost individual. It tells us in Romans 6 verse 3, Or do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We died, the old sinful man, we killed him. We buried him in the water and we raised up a new creature, a new individual. That's how you get into Christ. Unfaithful people will not be saved. No matter how much they believe, if they don't remain faithful, they're truly not believing, are they? And there are a lot of people who will tell you, well, I don't have to go to church. I've been baptized and I've been saved by faith and whatever the case may be. I know what the Bible says, but it's not necessary for me to go. Some say that if you've ever believed and confessed his name, you're saved. Confession alone is not sufficient. Matthew 7 verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who practice lawlessness. If you are not faithful, you will not have that salvation. It's not available to you. If you are your former faith, if you think it's going to save you and you still want to be disobedient, how can you expect the Lord to take you into heaven with Him? The Lord cannot be in the presence of sin. And disobedience to God is sin. Your former faith will not save you as long as you're in your present disobedient state. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. If you cannot be lost, why do you need to take heed? Why does the scripture tell you to take heed? Why warn you if you cannot fail? Because you can. You can fail. Second Peter 2 verses 20 through 22. For if they, after they have escaped the pollution of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. If you're a Christian and you walk away, the latter end's worse for you than it was before. For it would have been better for them not to have known the ways of righteousness than to have known it and turned away from the holy commandments delivered to them. But it happens to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit. And a sow having washed to wallow in the mire. Those who don't truly believe, this will be their situation. Those who decide to leave the church and leave Christ, this will be their situation. Because their faith is not real. They don't truly believe what they practice and say that they believe. There is no forgiveness for anyone who is impenitent 
failure to repent of your sins. You can die and not ask for forgiveness, but you won't have salvation. No forgiveness without repentance. Acts 10, uh, 17 verse 30. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. But he now commands all men everywhere to repent. How many? All men. Everyone needs to repent of any sins that they commit against God. Faith is always compatible with God's law. God gave us the law. If we truly believe it, then it will be compatible with God's law. We will maintain and keep our faith. But what about when it's not? And to whom did he swear they would not enter his rest? But to those who did not obey. That's who's not going to enter his rest. Those who do not obey his will. So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Unbelief means no faith. You have no faith in Christ. You have no faith in the, in the Lord. If you do not keep his commandments. If you do not obey his will. Throughout this lesson you've heard elements of the plan of salvation. For our viewing audience we'll put them on the screen again. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. And also Mark 16 verse 16. You need to repent of all your sins. Acts 2.38, for the remission of your sins, that's why you're baptized. Professing Christ, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God and confess Him for your salvation to be valid. You must be immersed in water, Acts 22.16, for the washing away of your sins. And you must remain faithful until the Lord comes for you. Revelation 2 verse 10. If you want to receive that crown of life. For the erring Christian, there is prayerful penance for the erring child of God. Acts 8 verse 22. I want to offer you the invitation or the opportunity while we stand and sing. Come boy.